Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Hastings, and I welcome you so warmly to another Barometer Readings webcast. Joining me today is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Officer, and we've invited Diana Avador, Head of Trading, to join us as well. On today's webcast, David will be pleased to provide a macro overview and, of course, at the tail end of the conversation, be happy to address your questions. So don't be shy. You can send us those questions via the Zoom chat or the Zoom Q&A. And with that, I turn the conversation over to the one and only David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining today. Um, it's been kind of a quiet week in the market. Uh, S&P has basically chopped its way sideways uh, since about the 20th of February, which is fine. Uh, markets can't go up every day. Uh, and we've been digesting some of the recent gains. Um, street's been busy sharpening their pencil on earnings estimates. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and from a sector perspective, you know, it has not been a market where everybody wins. Uh, there have been some very clear winners and, and some pretty clear losers, frankly. Um, but as usual, I'd like to just start from the top. You know, um, off the top, we continue to believe that North American equities, and specifically the U.S., continues to be in a structural bull market that started in 2013. Uh, we've been working our way higher since 2013 with a series of interruptions. Probably the, the most abrupt was the COVID sell-off, which briefly dipped us below the 200-week moving average, but very quick back above it. <clears throat> this most recent correction we went through from December of 2021 through January of 2024 uh, was about 25 months in length. Uh, the depth of the sell-off at the worst point was about 26%, which is typical for a cyclical bear market. Uh, we talked through that period about the fact that at some point we would exit make a new high, and that would probably kick off two to three years of pretty strong returns, uh, as is typically the case you can see when you look at this chart. Lots and lots of cyclical bear markets through the 80s and 90s, uh, four of them through the period since 2013. Not unusual. Uh, not any fun, but not unusual. Um, uh, and so given the fact that markets have been pretty quietly working their way higher, I think lots of people like to brace themselves and worry about what might come next. This is the last two years of the S&P. And you can see that really since October, the market's been marking its way higher in a very tight channel, uh, which we continue to be in. Um, so, you know, we know that corrections do come. Um, we aren't seeing anything at this point that points to the beginning of one. Um, would it be unusual for us to see a 5% correction? No. Would it be unusual for us to see a 3% pullback? No. Um, but on the other side of it, you know, we've had the market higher November, December, January, February, and March. That's an unusual thing. Going back to 1950, only a few occurrences where that was the case. In those cases, there were two months of April that were slightly negative or 81% were higher. Um, if you look at the average year, on average, 70% of the month of April were higher. Um, if you look at Q2, uh, market in those years was up 63% of the time, about 2.9% was the average. But for the final nine months of the year, 100% of the cases, the market was positive, an average of 11.9%. Versus 73% of the time. Uh, an average of 7%. So those are interesting statistics. We don't make decisions based on those. I thought I'd ask Diana to jump on and just give me her thoughts. You know, as our head trader, Diana manages all the execution transactions, but in the process, she stays in touch with, I think, 21 or 22 different capital markets investment dealers, everyone from Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, all the Canadian investment banks. Uh, and, you know, spends her life in chat rooms where people you know, prognosticate and give their views. Diana, I think anything stand out to you at this point? I mean, it has been kind of quiet. I think lots of people certainly flows over the last couple of weeks. People took some money out of equities, I think, concerned that there could be correction. Anything that you're seeing that sort of stands out? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dave. <clears throat> yeah, it's true. Talking to the street, I would just say uh, this is a bit of a chuckle. Um, the only thing that worries people is how much people are not worried. Um, 
right? Um, you know, you look at equity markets and, um, you know, you have, you have inflows and outflows, but on balance, you have, you have inflows. Um, there is some sector rotation and certainly the, um, Magnificent Seven, as they call it, or six now, X Tesla, uh, but the high multiple, uh, stocks that have really worked really well and for good reason, because they had great earnings. Um, those are, are being, um, taken off the table a little bit and money is rotating into some of the commodity uh, sectors. Um, people are talking about trying to pick the bottom on China um, and European earnings have been quite strong uh, without the market multiple uh, rallying as much as it has in the U.S. because, of course, um, this, uh, this strength in the U.S. equity market has been uh, P.E. multiple expansion. But earnings have followed. And earnings expectations are continuing to be strong. So money on average is, is, is flowing in. In the bond market, you know, rates are uh, probably at cycle highs. We're probably going to get three rate cuts, no matter what the economic data is, because inflation has come in quite uh, strongly. We're now below 3%. And in the U.S., um, uh, the rates are still at 55 So um, that's a big, big differential to really... It's quite restrictive. And what has offset that is quite high fiscal spending. A lot of people talking about how this is in the, um, an election year. Um, nobody is going to shake the tree. Uh, nobody's going to take money away from uh, people's pockets, um, from the fiscal side. So that has offset some of the monetary um, tightening that we've seen. And now the monetary um, side is, is getting a little easier with uh, central bankers um, as a whole, globally, um, poised to cut rates. Um, Diana, seeing... are you saying that are you saying that Chair Powell might be a little bit political? <laughs> well, I'm, I don't. I don't think he wants to see Trump in power. I can say that gently. Um, but you know, I don't think he's political per se. But really, there is over two and a half percent of tightness in the market relative to where inflation has come in. So he certainly um, has room for 75 beeps. Right. Um, and the market has digested. Um, it actually was 150 beeps, um, you know, six months ago. And the market has digested um, uh, only three cuts quite well. It, it, Diana, it's interesting. I'm just going to throw up the earnings progression for the, yeah. the, the street estimates. You know, I mean, uh, in red at the bottom is is with the estimates for 2023, which came down all through the year. Uh, 2024 numbers right now are expected to be something like two $243 for the S&P 500. But when we look out to 25, you know, numbers have been going higher. Um, I think that the estimate for fourth quarter 24 is 15% earnings growth. And it looks like another 15% earnings growth beyond that for 25. Sort of unusual, given that we're at the end of a tightening cycle, you know, for earnings to look as as rosy as that. Just really seems to me to show how resilient the economy is and how able it has been to absorb these higher rates. Yeah, I mean, I hope the view that four or five percent is not all that restrictive in the big picture. Um, yes, we've seen zero rates, and with Japan exiting their negative rate environment, we now have zero negative rates in the market. But that that has been a mistake, really. It's been a twenty-year mistake, but. Three, four, five percent rates is not all that restrictive when you think right. about it. And people have had savings coming out of COVID. Earnings are there. Employment. People have jobs. So, yeah. you know, and, and also unusual to see uh, operating margins expanding through a tightening cycle. Yeah, you I know, mean, four or five percent. Just shows you how resilient just how resilient businesses are, and then. I love this this last slide here. This is the um, the uh, leading indicators. Twenty four months of monthly declines in the leading economic indicators, but this month we get the first improvement, uh, net positive in the month over month leading indicators. I think that's that's telling also, and probably the market is sniffing this stuff out as well. Yeah. And I mean, companies. You go back to the earnings; um, they have enough to do their buybacks. That's continuing. Uh, JP Morgan raised dividends twice in the last year. 
So they're raising dividends and the dividend growers are doing pretty well. Um, you know, the, the IPO market has opened up a little bit. There's been some, some new issues um, that have held in quite well. So yeah, I go, yeah, people are just worried about all the goodness, really. Well, we'll, we'll so. keep on trying to look around the corner. I mean, but part of, part of this uh, webcast we do each week is to look at the things that happen have been happening to try and recognize things that are changing uh, and to try and make sure that the way we're positioned continues to make sense and, and be transparent about it. So thanks very much for jumping on. I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to blast through a bunch of stuff, uh, but thanks very much for joining us in this week. Um, when, when we look at Canada, you know, Canada uh, was weak through most of last year, but starting in October really started to lift partly because of some of the sectors in the market that have weakened up. Uh, but I like to look at this, you know, long, very long-term picture and recognize that Canada looks a lot like, you know, the U S market in 2013, 14, you know, we've just come out of a long period, 2008 through 2021, where the market didn't perform. Um, and like usual sentiment mm -hmm. as we come out has been really, really negative, like tons of flows out of Canadian stocks uh against a market that that has in general been rising so you know we we look at the differentials and and we know and we've talked about how the earnings multiples are, are quite different for global stocks down at 14 times earnings versus u.s stocks at 21 times earnings part of that reflects the fact that there's a lot of technology in the u.s market that's a little bit more expensive and it is a big differential but i wanted to highlight this i thought this was an interesting uh piece from goldman you know, it looked at peak multiples at the end of long bull markets. And, you know, in the nifty 50, um, you had the average forward PE at 35 times. In fact, it was com com some companies traded at 70 to 90 times earnings. Uh, in 2000, the best companies traded at 42 times earnings with about a net interest margin of 11%. So both 10 and 11% net interest margins. As much as people think that the, the, the big US mega cap stocks are expensive, they traded 26 times earnings with almost a 30% profit margin, a net margin. So, you know, they're not as expensive as people would say, but they are more expensive than global stocks. Um, when we look at you know, markets like we have been, like Japan coming out of a 30-year bear market. Look, last last five months, just absolutely blasting off. Um, India, a similar picture. Uh, Europe, a similar picture. Uh, Mexico, threatening. You know, we say, well, what's driving that? Well, one of the things is earnings. When we look at the differential, you know, where the earnings multiples were in 22 versus where they are now, the multiples are expanding. Um, but it's interesting. U.S. multiple went from 16 times to 21 times. The most recent change in in 12-month uh, forward earnings per share is estimated at 7%. Um, but the multiples expanded by 30%. The rest of the world, growth about the same. The multiples expanded also not quite as much. But interesting areas like Europe, Eurozone, uh, estimate for 12-month forward earnings is up 19%. Uh, and still only trading at 13 times earnings. That would tell me and support why it is that maybe European stocks are blasting off. Um, you know, we look at Japan, you know, 12% forward earnings growth, still trading at 16 times. So there's, I think the most interesting thing is that there is room for earnings growth and room for multiple expansion around the world which is probably why equity markets are behaving the way they are. And the MSCI World Index, XUS, um, is within a whisper of breaking out to a high it hasn't seen since 2007. So interesting times for equities. Equities continue to look pretty positive. For fixed income and yields, you know, uh, still very clearly we saw a generational low in interest rates in 2020 these are the return the yields on a 10-year bond seeing a series of moves higher and higher highs and higher lows no sign that that's shifting at this point when we look at the price of the very long-term uh, u.s treasury bond 
really not far off the 53% decline low from 2023. So, you know, we still are in a bond bear market. A lot of people look for a pullback in short-term yields to fuel a rally in the bond market. But what we would say is that we've actually seen more action, uh, certainly in stocks than bonds on expectations that rates could come down a little bit. Um, and that's not so unusual. You know, when, when generational lows happened in the late 1949, 1950, and then rates proceeded to ratchet their way higher for the next number of years, it actually came at a time when the stock market, you know, went up 15% a year during that period. So when people worry that higher interest rates mean stocks can't go up, it generally is not the case, especially if there's a little bit of inflation. Um, you know, during this period, the dividend growing stocks did particularly well. And it shouldn't be a surprise that as we sit right now, dividend growing stocks are outperforming both the stock market and certainly high dividend paying stocks. So our focus really has been on dividend growers to try and offset the cost of rising inflation. Now, we run this tactical income strategy that can be anywhere. And if we take the period of time we've been running that strategy since 2000, in blue are all the periods where the yield on a 10-year bond was rising. So as an income investor, when yields are rising, it is hard to generate a return. In general, if you took each of those periods and looked at what happened to the price of a 10-year bond, they fell in every case. And, and in this tactical income strategy, it sort of was built to deal with rising rates. We've been able to generate some pretty positive returns in each of those rising rate periods. The most recent one from September of 2020 to now, we're up about 32% versus the 10-year the bond down about 20% in price. So this is something that I think is, is something we want to continue to focus on. Over the last year, from the middle of March to present, uh, the S&P equal weight up 22%. A TSX up 17, the aggregate bond index is up 1.6. Um, the income strategy is up 24% over the period. Our equity strategy is up 31. Uh, and our global macro portfolio is up 27, 28. And, and through the year this year, just important, we're looking at, you know, the equal weight, sorry, the uh, MSCI all world XUS is up about 4% and our newer global strategy is up about 7.9. So, these themes, I think, are, are working pretty well. Supporting the idea that maybe we have reflation in the economy, commodity prices continue to improve, um, despite a you know, very tight um, uh, monetary policy. Surprisingly, commodity prices have been very resilient in the face. The most recent month, we're getting a nice big bump and certainly rallying versus the bond market. So... Um, this reflationary theme, I think, is something that continues, despite the fact to think that still positioning is quite light in commodities and energy in general. Gold prices have had a very strong month. Uh, I think that's notable. Uh, this is quite a prolific price pattern called a cup and handle. Uh, after consolidating, generally, you'd like to see a significant breakout. Well, this is pretty significant. And, and it reminds me a lot. Of, of what can happen when central banks really start to load up. Uh, we're seeing this in a number of countries around the world, central banks adding to their gold holdings, as opposed to treasury bonds. I understand that. They're like, in Wales, nobody wants to lose money. Uh, they're looking at these as liquid safe holdings. Um, the last time we went through a period where you had this sort of long bear market followed by consolidation, like we're seeing right now, uh, when it when it finally broke out, gold rallied 350 percent from 2005 through 2012, so seven years. Um, we don't know what's going to happen, but this is, I think, for me as a technician, a very important technical signal that you know we are facing a reflationary environment. And people are looking for other types of assets other than bonds. Um, Bitcoin continues to kind of uh, chug along. I, I think important to note. You know, relative to equal weight S and P, you know, is outperforming. We're not big, big Bitcoin advocates, but we do have about a twelve percent weight in our macro portfolio. Um, so, from a big picture, you know, equities continue to look quite good. Um, dividend growth continues to look quite good. Um, global stocks continue to look quite good. Commodities in general 
uh, I think are improving and uh, from a very underweight position. Um, and some of these alternative assets, you know, are certainly garnering attention as well. Now, we don't have to be everywhere. We, we got a, a sort of target market leadership. Um, we try to get the neighborhoods right. 70% of return comes from being in the right neighborhood, the right asset classes and the sectors that are leading. We don't have to be everywhere. And then we try and express in the portfolios using securities that we see as best in class, those that are the highest quality, those that are good to begin with, but where we see in the numbers, things are getting better. We're always looking for areas where breadth is improving, where over time, more and more securities are performing well. When we look at global equity markets, the fact that you know, not just the US market is rallying, but the Canadian market's rallying, European markets are rallying, Asian markets are rallying, that's a sign of health. That's buying spreading to more and more of that asset class. And if we were to see deterioration in breadth in a sector or a geographic region, that would cause us to say, okay, something's changing for the worse. So we're always watching. As it sits right now, our indicators are broadly positive. These improved over the course of the week. Our long-term indicators, percent of stocks and uptrends have been improving. Percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving averages has been improving. That's good short-term indicator. The percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum or upward trajectory in the U.S. now working its way higher again. Uh, percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows, also pushing higher. Uh, and percent of stocks trading above their 30-week uh, or 150-day moving average, you know, is now pushing up on uh, 65%. So as long as those breadth indicators are improving, we want to be invested. It's not for us to say market's wrong. Generally, there's a reason why and probably multiple reasons why the market's behaving the way that it is. <clears throat> but it's important to be in the right areas. Um, we've talked a lot about financials over the last number of months since June of this past year. And on all these charts, the light blue line here in the bottom, if it's rising, it means that the security is outperforming the S&P. So this rising relative strength line shows us that the XLF, which is the ETF that holds a basket of financials, is trading better than 80% of all the companies in the S&P over the last number of months. Well, it's over the last 52 weeks, uh, but certainly really improving since June of last year. It's been on a tear since October. Uh, and you can see it's made up of you know, banks, credit card companies, uh, insurance companies like Berkshire. Uh, and uh, we've seen a lot of strength in insurance. But when we pull the lens back, the big picture for financials looks a lot like what we saw in global markets. Turns out financials are one of the biggest sectors uh, in the global universe. In fact, the biggest at about 22%. And the last five months, we've seen this thing marching higher. But it's not for no reason. Um, we are seeing a little pickup in IPO activity, a couple of big ones today that were quite successful. Uh, we're seeing more mergers and acquisitions, so that adds to profitability. There's been a lot of corporate bond issuance, lots of fees generated there, and trading volumes in general have been working their way higher. So, you know, we own shares in the TSX, uh, and it's had a really good week up sharply over the course of the week. Uh, on a combination of their their commodity trading business and their um, and their uh, stock trading business, um, so the financial sectors you know continues to be strong. Real um, uh, uh, insurance marking its way higher, actually a little stronger than the whole sector itself. We've talked about Progressive and Fairfax. The big banks continue to really outperform the regional banks. This is a relative strength chart. Big banks relative to regional banks. We highlighted last week that part of the reason may be that the regional banks are sort of stuffed full of commercial real estate in various degrees. They're in more difficulty. JP Morgan has been our preferred holding. It's been very steady in rising its, raising its dividend. Uh, we talked about adding uh, Citigroup a few months ago, uh, and it's certainly working its way higher really nicely. We own National Bank in Canada. Also, another bank that owns almost no real estate exposure. Uh, and then the capital markets banks in general, KCE is an ETF that holds a basket of asset managers uh, and capital markets banks, all of which do well in a world where the market's doing a little bit better. So um, I, it wouldn't surprise me if we added something like Goldman Sachs over the next little while, uh, as we're seeing the IPO uh, activity pick up. Industrials, um, now up 
32% off the lows in October. Um, I was noting this week that, you know, very high percentage of the strongest relative strength stocks in the market are industrials, not technology. I think there's two of the top 12 stocks uh, in the U.S. market from a relative strength perspective are technology, and NVIDIA, of course, would be one, uh, but a lot of very strong um, uh, uh, industrial companies. On technology, we really like to watch this relative strength line which has waned a little bit since October. It's obviously a highly dynamic group. When we look at, this is the XLK ETF, the largest holdings, Microsoft, well, that's a holding. Apple, we sold in December. Yeah. Uh, Broadcom, we certainly own today. And NVIDIA, three of the top four are performing really well. You know, NVIDIA in introduced their new chip architecture two weeks ago. Stock is now basically trading at all time highs. Microsoft is trading better than 87% of companies in the S&P, just a whisper off the high. And Broadcom, which not only manufactures chips, but has uh, software, uh, design software for designing chips, likely to have a pretty good tailwind from AI, you know, continues to perform well. Outside of those groups, materials uh, have been marching higher over the last few weeks. Last two weeks, one of the strongest increases in relative strength. The copper miners have come out of a consolidation and a bear market that goes back to 2013. We've talked about tech resources. We've talked about capstone. We've talked about uh, foreign mining as a, as a smaller company. Uh, we don't own it, but I'll just highlight Southern Copper. This is the biggest copper producer in South America. It's an $80 billion company. You know, look at how it's come out of this bear market. Look at this last month, just absolutely, you know, blasting off. So I think that there's some legs behind basic materials. We also think that there's uh, legs behind energy. And a lot of the biggest energy producers like Canadian Natural Resources, you know, really have started to lift off over the last couple of weeks. So there's some pretty clear themes. Um, Carbon-based fuel is not going away. I don't think that we have ever moved away from any source of fuel. We have added other fuels on top or sources of energy, but it's, it's unlikely we are moving away from carbon-based energy completely anytime soon. The groups that are have-nots continue to be have-nots. Um, this is an important concept. We've seen the price of the XLV, which is the a healthcare ETF. It's a broad-based ETF owning pharmaceutical companies, healthcare management uh, companies, health insurers, medical devices, biotech. You've seen it move higher in price, but just important to remember that we always have to compare versus what's happening in the rest of the market. So you can see that relative strength or the relative performance for healthcare has been falling. And in fact, really at relative strength, new lows, even though the price has been moving higher, higher, it's just really lagging the market. Consumer discretionary is the same. Consumer staples are the same. Telecom is the same. Real estate investment trusts are the same. In a lot of cases, these are companies that use capital. They need funding, right? A, a utility uses debt to build facilities and then hopes to get a return on it. When the cost of capital goes up or bond yields go up, then it gets harder for leveraged companies to make money. And so these are the types of companies we're really trying to stay away from until we see something change. So it looks like we continue to be in a world where for the last couple of years, companies that are more economically sensitive are outperforming companies that have low economic sensitivity. Dividend growers are outperforming high dividend payers. And it gives us a pretty clear view as to where we should be focused. Our overweights continue to be financials, which is growing organically, frankly, because the share prices are moving higher. Technology moved down another step over the last couple of weeks as we exited our Adobe position. Industrials are a significant overweight. Materials is growing as almost a triple weight of the index and our energy weight continues to grow. 
while some of these other groups are underweights and maintain underweight healthcare staples, consumer discretionary communications, real estate, and utilities. So we're fairly targeted. I find solace in the fact that we are positioned differently than the market. If we take fund manager positioning, bond investments are the biggest overweight. Telecoms and technology, significant overweights and utilities. On the underweights, managers are underweight energy, underweight Europe, underweight materials, underweight insurance, underweight banks, underweight commodities which means that if these continue to perform well, they're gonna to have to chase them. And if everybody's making money, there's not a lot of people who wanna be sellers. So that's why we watch the positioning. In the last two weeks, relative price performance in these groups has really picked up. In general, they are groups that we're focused in. And when we look at global markets, we see that the biggest things impacting the MSCI All World Index XUS are financials, industrials, technology, and then a much bigger weight than the S&P in materials and a bigger weight in energy. So measures of risk. Beyond breadth, we like to see how much corporate bond issuers have to pay in interest relative to sovereign bonds as a measure of what investors consider to be the risk of default, and that continues to come in. I thought this was an interesting graphic. It shows uh, the percentile extra return based on the last 20 year range. Investment grade bonds basically have excess yield in the, only the 10th percentile of the last 20 years range. High yield bonds, the same. So you can see corporate bonds and high yield are not discounting tremendous credit risk. In fact, investors obviously are comfortable with the risk. Mm -hmm. When we look at Europe, the excess return is higher, but it's still trading below the 50th percentile or on average better than it had been over the last 20 years. So we think that in general, credit conditions are still favorable. When we look at volatility, we note that the range that volatility is currently in is the range where volatility has averaged during cyclical bull markets. So until we see this change, we have to think that the vol market is not expecting excess volatility. So breadth models are generally positive. Earnings are generally positive. Positioning is underweight, some of the key sectors. Volatility is low. Credit risk is low. The calendar is on our, on our side because in an election year, you tend to see stocks firm up from uh, middle of March on through October. Uh, and uh, we think in general, uh, credit conditions are pretty good. So we don't want to be too afraid of the fact that the market's quiet. There's an old saying, don't ever short a quiet market. And as long as we have these conditions, I think that we're in pretty good shape. If things get more difficult, we'll be very happy to get more defensive. And you'll hear about it here on our weekly webcast. So with that, Pamela, if there's any questions, certainly we could give a crack at answering them. Hey, thanks, Dave. Uh, one second, let me get back on the camera here. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, as always, a great review. We don't have any questions today. I guess Stephen from Toronto is taking a, a, a vacation. <laughs> uh, so, so with that, thank you so much, Dave. And uh, thank you, Diana, so much for joining. And we always like to hear what you have to say. Uh, and Dave, I'll leave you with the final word. Yeah, folks, certainly if uh, if you're too shy to ask a question online, that's that's not a problem. Send us an email. Give us a call. Um, you know, we, we like to think that what we do is unique. Um, we like to think that once we get through big transitions in the market, we get opportunities to get positioned and take advantage of things. I think that we've got two to three years of outsized opportunity in front of us. Um, and I'm sure there will be interruptions, uh, but uh, we're going to manage the risk the best that we can. 
Um, if you'd like to have a conversation, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we, uh, that's the business that we're in. So, uh, Pamela, thanks for, for, uh, moderating today. Diana, thanks for jumping on. Pleasure. And, um, uh, Diana, you, you're on BNN tomorrow, are you? Tomorrow morning, nine o'clock. What time? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Okay. Well, I asked James if he wanted to come on today, but I think he's on BNN now. So, uh, the barometer news network. All right. Uh, everyone have a great week and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week.